Hello and welcome back everyone uh, to you are watching the Unite uh, Global Summit 2020 and uh, we are here uh, with the Unite Global Board uh, in a panel that we have decided to call Time to Take Action. Uh, as uh, I've stated at the opening session of this uh, summit, more importantly, uh, more important than everything we are saying throughout these two days is exactly what are we going to do after the summit is over, making sure that the ideas, the recommendations, the policies that uh, come out of, this, uh, of these two days of discussions are truly implemented at the service of the people that we as parliamentarians, as members of parliaments, of congresses and senates that we represent and making sure that the people uh, especially those in most vulnerable situations are not left behind. And so it is my great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce my dear friends at the UNITE uh, Global Board. Uh, we have current representation across seven regions around the world. And each of these regions is led by one of these honorable uh, representatives of parliamentarians or former parliamentarians in their own region. And we are honored that they have uh, such experienced and committed leaders in those regions to ending infectious diseases as a global health threat within our network. But before passing the floor to my esteemed colleagues, I would first like uh, to introduce a written statement by the United Nations Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, who uh, many may know as uh, also the former prime minister of my country, Portugal. Uh, and we will be sharing that statement online for everyone to see. But the statement reads that, and I'm quoting uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres by saying, thank you for coming together to build political networks, join forces and push for action to end infectious diseases. The COVID-19 pandemic has compelled us to confront long ignored risks and fragilities, including inadequate health systems, unequal access to healthcare, gaps in social protection and structural inequalities. Where health systems are unable to provide equitable access and entitlements to services, the poorest and most vulnerable suffer the most. These gaps hinder efforts to beat back outbreaks of communicable diseases such as HIV, AIDS, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, and malaria. Investing in universal health coverage is more urgent than ever. COVID-19 exploits the weaknesses and cracks in systems and societies, making it clear that tackling infectious diseases hinges on equitable access to universal health coverage. I therefore welcome your support of UNITE's 2020 statement and your commitment to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Let us work together to ensure a decade of delivery and, and infectious diseases and provide quality health care for all, end quote, a message from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Antonio Guterres. And so um, that was a, a very important message that I think really uh, frames the discussions that we're going to have here with our board which, uh, as you notice, that the UN Secretary General mentioned, the UNITE statement, which is going to be signed not only by members of our network, starting by our chapter chairs who are going to mention it, but also many of UNITE's partners. And I'm going to take this opportunity to highlight um, some of the aspects of this statement, um, as it is probably the most important or one of the most important outcomes of this global summit. Uh, the, uh, our partners will sign on along with parliamentarians this statement, which urgently calls on governments and parliaments to not lose sight of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, in the midst and in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. You can find the full version of this statement on the left side of the screen if you are using the conference platform or at the our UNITE Network uh, website, unitenetwork.org, where the full version of the declaration of this statement is uh, published. But before passing the floor to my esteemed colleagues, uh, members of parliament and UNITE chapter chairs from around the world, I would like to highlight the call to action that is within the statement that reads as following. The call to action says, hereby UNITE 
as current and former representatives of people alongside decision makers and organizations working in global health urgently call on government to prioritize investment in research, development and innovation, encouraging the acceleration of critical vaccines, medicines and diagnostics while safeguarding equitable access for those who need them. Accelerate the, ex the achievement of the sustainable development goals, namely universal health coverage, which need to include supporting policies that safeguard and reinforce national health budgets for public health services and prioritize prevention, primary and person-centered healthcare. Assure global and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics by uniting efforts for a fast and global solutions. Prioritize health promotion and infectious disease prevention through transparent, accountable and inclusive public health governance. Empower people and communities by acknowledging their role in the first line of defense for affected populations and as leaders on the ground. Support them fully as they are the backbone of communicable diseases programs around the world. Having said that, and that I, I urge you to visit and read the full statement online, both on your platform or at the UNITE website, and to speak on these issues and on our shared commitment to ending infectious diseases at global health, uh, in, uh, to end uh, infectious diseases as a global threat, I am now going to pass the floor to my colleagues at, U at the uh, part of the UNITE Global Board, starting by UNITE Regional Chair for Latin American and the Caribbean, the Honorable Gisela Scaglia. It's an honor to have you on board. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. I'm Gisela Scaglia, a member of Parliament in Argentina, and UNITE Chapter Chair for Latin America and the Caribbean. And I also support the UNITE statement. I'm happy to be here. Great job, UNITE. Clap, clap to Amish, Bicot, Doria, and all the team. We are united today to pass a strong political message that the people living with HIV and TB and our target of ending AIDS and TB by 2030 are not forgotten, nor will be left behind. The COVID-19 pandemic show us a brave new world to say that in Shakespearean terms. And the pandemic also showed us that we were not at all prepared to fight against a global threat like the COVID-19 post. Prevention, preparedness and response to the spread of infection disease turned to be the main goals of this defying year 2020. Also, the COVID-19 gave us a big opportunity to discuss public health related issues in the parliaments. The relationship among public health, the country's economies, and the regulation of the daily life of the citizens of our countries in the world is the big issue after COVID-19. We are part of this discussion. And building networks of parliamentarians like UNITE and many others, it's today more important than ever. Our voices must be strong. We also have to work hard to increase domestic resources and invest in pandemic preparedness. It has never been more clear that we need to accelerate innovation through research and development. This pandemic made us face our biggest mistakes. And we have to say, we did not like that sort of mirror image the COVID-19 had to offer. We could clearly see all our imperfections all that we had failed to build in a timely manner. In Latin America, we are fully aware of the inequities of our health systems, fully aware of the lack of a clear leadership to navigate through these troubled waters and the hard difficulties related to the restricted liberties and the pain of the families who lost a dear one. And what about the post-pandemic situation for the Latin American countries? We are pretty sure we'll be facing bigger problems than the ones we had before this pandemic. And I mean economical, social and political problems. That's why we have to start a call to action to face these difficulties. 
to reflect upon this crisis and to build back after COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic confronted us with all discriminatory and violent stigmas. The people who tested positive for coronavirus disease have to face stigmatizing speed. It is more difficult when you are a doctor or a nurse, but these kind of stigmas do exist. We have to break those stigmas or stigmatizing vocabulary commonly used to talk about infection disease, like HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, and sexual transmission disease, and now COVID-19. And what I mean, not only trying to solve the new and pandemic-related problems, but I also mean changing all paradigms. We have in Argentina one of the first law about HIV AIDS in Latin America which was passed in August 1990. But as you can imagine, 30 years, it's a lot of time. And we have to assume the compromise of reformulating this law and making a better one. We have to change the paradigm. We need an integral framework. We have to talk about health promotion and health education. Our actual law has stigmatizing vocabulary. We have new treatments, we know more about HIV AIDS, but we keep thinking about it with fear as the end of person's life. These are stigmas and we need to break those stigmas. We, as parliamentarians, have non-delegable responsibilities to hear the voice of the people, to pay attention to the different civil society organizations, to ensure that there is universal health access and to reform, if necessary, our health systems. We are fully aware these are huge responsibilities and we must rise to the occasion. I commit to work to protect more vulnerable populations, to work without stigmas and to give better and equal conditions to the people affected by infectious disease. The challenge, it's great, it is time to unite. Thank you. I now pass the floor to my colleague, Esther Pasaris from Kenya. Um, okay, so my name is Esther Pasaris. I'm a member of parliament in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And um, wow, um, I have to say that um, I'm really proud to be associated with UNITE and to represent them in the in the Eastern Southern Africa uh, chapter. Um, you know, when we, uh, when we think about uh, the SDGs, you know, we, say we had the MDGs, we had eight years, then we have the SDGs. And now we've realized that um, with, the, with the SDGs, everything seems to have taken a back seat, you know, all, and everything that we had on the SDGs were actually so important uh, because with the SDGs, we had the world order on how to eradicate poverty, how to deal with health, how to deal with decent jobs, how to deal with the environment. We had all these 17 SDGs, but unfortunately, uh, uh, we realized that we were not ready for a pandemic. We were not ready to deal with uh, a global pandemic. I mean, um, Kenya is very fortunate in that the president had coined his agenda into four areas, one of them being universal health care. And with universal health care, we saw the opening of a, a really state-of-the-art hospital, uh, the Kenyatta University Hospital. And we're fortunate that that was there because it handled quite a number of the, uh, of the COVID cases. But again, we had devolved health and all the 47 counties were not prepared with not enough ICU beds. So there was a lot of panic on where you're going to go. Then we have cultural practices in our country uh, when it comes to funerals and how we handle it. So all of a sudden you had a lot of restrictions in gathering. We had uh, a lot of, um, um, we had curfews. Uh, we had, uh, uh, of course, isolation, uh, social distancing, wearing of masks. I mean, this was a lot. And then when you, when you also looked at it, about, 50, uh, about 5 million people have lost their jobs over and above the 5 million that were unemployed. And then we saw gender-based violence on the increase. So basically, uh, all the things, all the gains that we've made on the SDGs seem to have been lost. All the gains that we made on, um, uh, on, um, 
on infectious diseases, TB, HIV, AIDS, everything took a back seat. Uh, and then we were all focused on COVID. And we even saw situations where during quarantine, women could not probably attend uh, or be attended to go to hospital. So we, we've realized that uh, universal health care uh, requires so much more to be done. Uh, and the SDGs are also important. So as a country, um, we, we, we feel we did very well. We are very fortunate that we didn't have the kind of uh, um, uh, cases that you had uh, in Europe. And probably uh, and the deaths that you've had all all over, like in America, 180,000 people uh, dead. We we haven't had that kind of magnitude in Africa, and in South Africa we can see a decline right now, and that's because uh, people are saying maybe maybe it's the weather. But I think what we've learned is that we have to listen to our professionals, uh, and our government was very quick to ensure that the professionals were brought on board. And uh, we're briefing the president and, um, you know, we tested, we t uh, had a COVID uh, fund immediately, but we did do a few things as right as uh, Uganda. I mean, for instance, Uganda had a feeding program in place um, and, you know, it was a bit more orderly than we were. So we had a problem in that the feeding programs are not there. There was a lot of uh, people that were distressed because of food. We depended on private sector, even though we had the task force. But uh, the president quickly came up with um, with a program where uh, the young and the youth were given jobs to you know to clean up the various estates and to earn income. So there's a lot of interventions that countries can put in, uh, and I think Kenya did the best that it could. And we're very lucky and fortunate that Africa hasn't had the hit like um, America and uh, Europe. Uh, but at the same time, it made us aware of the fact that we really need to be prepared. We really need to have the facilities in place and we really need to make sure that the civic education is there. So uh, there's a lot of work that I think we will all have to do as parliamentarians. We will have to really step up and make sure that universal health care becomes a primary goal uh, of every nation. And you have to put the right laws. And then, of course, you have to back it up with uh, with budgets. Uh, I think uh, COVID taught not just Kenya, but the whole world that uh, we really need um, to, you know, be ready, be prepared. And then the, you know, the donors and the foreign countries, I think when they all had the problems, uh, of course, we were very fortunate in that we were still able to get support. But I think uh, other areas, other infectious diseases like hepatitis, TB, uh, um, HIV, AIDS have actually suffered less and less people going to hospital. And obviously that is a concern. Uh, customs and traditions are actually people are having a discussion about them. But all in all, I believe that, um, you know, with this statement that um, the summit statement that uh, United has put together, uh, if we follow and we focus on leave no one behind um, as a world, we will be able to learn from each other and bridge the gaps. But there is a lot of pain. Uh, we've realized that in Kenya, we need to put a lot of safe houses because we saw gender based violence on the increase. So um, all in all, I believe that the SDGs should continue being the perimeter that we guide ourselves. And they will need to be reviewed uh, in terms of how much far back have we gone and how can we accelerate so that in this last decade, we can actually make sure that we don't lose uh, what we've already gained. Um, I would like to now pass you to my colleague, uh, a former member of parliament from Ghana. Uh, Unite Chapter Chair for Western and Central Africa, Akusa Dansal. Thank you. Regional Chairs, distinguished participants at this summit. I'm also delighted to take my turn to support the Global Call to Action by Unite. It's been two days of back-to-back -back but interesting discussions on various aspects of global health pandemics, including COVID, which one of the speakers yesterday described as a public health earthquake, which has turned the world upside down since January 2020 and has created a new normal way that we are still you know, adjusting to. In my 23 country region of responsibility, UNFPA, as of July 31st, 2020, unfortunately, there is no current uh, data, reported over 177,800 cases of COVID-19 with 2,000, 
with 2,845 unfortunate deaths and a mortality rate of about 1.6. It was also reported that from the um, data, health workers or frontline workers to be the, continue to be the most infected with some top physicians and surgeons, unfortunately succumbing to the COVID-19, a situation that will worsen our already weak health service delivery. May the souls of those loved ones who pass rest in perfect peace. On a fairly positive note, however, about 28.4 uh, patients who were infected at the time were still under treatment, while 70% of infected people had recovered within the period. Oh, other challenges being experienced in my region in the management of COVID-19 include lack of PPEs, poor political leadership resulting among others in politicization in the use of COVID resources, corruption, and inefficient facilities of health infrastructure for isolation, quarantine, or treatment. Additionally, just as in other parts of the world, COVID-19 has affected travel, leisure and tourism, education, businesses, and increased mental health concerns, as well as gender-based violence. Compared to other regions, however, we will say that our situation is not bad, but could be better if we had the right political leadership in place. It therefore means that we must not be complacent. It is clear to all of us that the health, humanitarian, and socioeconomic challenges brought about by COVID-19 requires global and regional solidarity and response, a point that has been strongly canvassed at this summit. No single country, whether developed or developing, can claim to have the ability to handle the COVID-19 pandemic, hence the various partnerships and interventions already in place. The world, including my region, surely needs a strong political leadership to end COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, such as malaria, HIV, AIDS, TB, and hepatitis B. Already, some fantastic global partnerships are ongoing with UNITE, the AHF, the WHO, the Global Fund, Gavi, FINE, CEPI, the World Bank, Welcome University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, United, and others, too many to mention here, to address COVID-19 and its related challenges. I strongly support these efforts and urge others here to come on board to do so. This is the reason I strongly support UNITE's action, call to action, to accelerate action to save our world from premature destruction from infectious diseases and build back better after COVID-19. I strongly urge the political leadership of my region, current and former members of parliament, senators, speakers of our various parliaments, the media, private sector, civil society organizations, among others, to support this agenda. Unite and I will provide the necessary leadership to ensure we obtain successful outcomes in my region. Let's remember that pandemics do not discriminate in their approach, form, or attack. They strike when least expected, with very devastating impacts. Therefore, we need to get together and solve the problem together. The time to act is now. With these words, I hand over the mic to my um, colleague, um, the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Akua. I am Ipsi Samazari, member of uh, Parliament in Morocco and United oh. Chapter Chair for the Middle East and North Africa. It's a great honor for me to speak at uh, our first, uh, uh, at our United First event held virtually. The MENA region is facing a number of infectious diseases and emerging infections some of these turning into explosive outbreaks. For example, the MENA region is far from reaching the UNAIDS 1990-90 targets to end HIV-AIDS by the end of the current year, 
across the region countries in 1919, uh, just 52 of people living with uh, HIV were aware of their status. Many, many region countries are putting significant effort into the scale up uh, of their response to infectious diseases, such as developing national strategies and implementing health programs for their people, but targets are still far and objectives are still uh, yet unreached. The pandemic of the COVID-19 is now, is now bringing a new generation of uh, challenges, especially to our health systems. Governments in the MENA region have rapidly reacted to contain the coronavirus to, lim to limit the spread of the COVID-19 in the region. We can highlight significant differences uh, between countries in terms of their capacity to help to react on the healthcare side. The pandemic is also causing dramatic economic and social consequences, in particular for the most vulnerable youth, women, informal workers. A regional agenda of reform could help address the region's structural imbalances and support the design of a new inclusive growth model. Many women are at the front line of the COVID-19 response, as in many regions of the world, many women at, are at the core of the health emergency response as they make up the majority of workers in the uh, healthcare and social services sectors across the region, thus exposing them to greater risks of contracting the virus. Lockdowns and curfew measures are likely to exacerbate the already high rates of domestic uh, violence across the MENA region. As governments are putting together important economic and social programs to counteract the impact of the pandemic and preparing their post-crisis relaunch, the COVID-19 pandemic represents also an opportunity for the MENA region, for the MENA countries to address the stru st structural issues facing women and girls in the region which have been exacerbated by the crisis. I do hardly believe that global problems like infectious diseases need global answers to ensure more efficient, more responsive and sustainable sol solutions. As a parliamentarian, as a Moroccan, African and Arab policymaker, I'm committed toward the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals over the next decade only one decade left of more ambitious actions and a stronger commitment to deliver the SDGs by 2030. In these times of the COVID-19 crisis, SDGs are even more important. The agenda 2030 gives a comprehensive framework to address the crisis and build resilience to current and future shocks, whether they are related to health, to the economy, or to the environmental issues, etc. As parliamentarians, as democratic elected representatives of our people and nations, we have a critical role to play. Through our active poli political intervention and political leadership, through legislation, through challenging our public health policies, through parliamentary diplomacy, and many other ways and tools of action, we can make a concrete positive change in our countries and in our war world. Let's stay mobilized to honor our co commitments at all political levels, international, regional, national, and local, to leave no one behind. It's time to unite. Thank you. I now pass the floor to my colleague, Andrew, from Germany. Guests and uh, friends, my name is Andrew Ullman. I'm a member of the parliament here in Germany. I'm also UNITE chapter chair for Western and Central Europe. And by training, I'm a physician in hematology, oncology, and specialized in infectious diseases. I also support the 2020 UNITE summit statement. But the coronavirus has changed the world significantly. We heard this before. And we need to reshape our world now. This is, for Europe, one of the most challenging crises since we faced the Second World War, where millions of people who are experiencing death and uh, morbidity and mortality. And this untold misery and suffering of the virus overwhelms us all, 
and not only our bodies, also the economies. Western Central Europe had different trends compared to the rest of the world. It started off in Southern Europe and Italy, where we saw devastating pictures very similar to China, and the virus hit various reasons, uh, regions very strongly, and it was obvious that Europe, with actually a good uh, overall healthcare system, were not prepared for a pandemic situation. Basically, also in politics, a pandemic was ignored. It was never a topic. Global health was not a real topic in the parliaments in our countries. And now we have to see how we deal with the immediate past, but we also have to learn, and this is our big chance in this pandemic, to be prepared for the next pandemic situation. And it is obvious it costs a lot of lives and, of course, the economy stability. We need to stop uh, the spread in our countries, it was only possible by a drastic lockdown measures done in various countries, a situation that didn't make a lot of people very happy, but with lockdowns and what I personally thought was a terrible word, social distancing, we gained time. But the risk of resurgence of a second wave of COVID-19 is obvious, like we see it right now in France, and it's never secure that it could be somewhere else. But the good news in the situation, five months after the crisis started in Europe, the, we learned a lot more about transmission. We learned a lot about the viruses and the virus that we have. We are close to effective treatment and vaccines are just around the corner. And that is an important global health issue, how to distribute vaccines around the world. It cannot just be that rich countries can afford vaccines. All countries in this world need this, uh, this vaccine to um, help their fellow citizens. The, the next steps are very obvious. It's not only the virus that is of a concern this coming fall or winter in, this, in the Northern Hemisphere. It's also a concern of democracy stability. It is, we hear a lot, even in our countries, we hear a lot about conspiracy theorists, about fake news. And it appears to me, it seems to be more contagious than the virus itself. We're also, uh, facing a possible a twin pandemic with the influenza season just around the corner uh, we might have the uh, problem that our healthcare systems might collapse if we do not get prepared for our future uh, situation so we need to be prepared for the uh, worst we need to strengthen our preparedness and readiness of all emergency systems and routine healthcare delivery we have to manage the approaching uh, influenza season sustain our uh, economies, because economy and health are two sides of the same uh, coin and address other challenges like increasing antimicrobial resistance and the spread of new infectious disease due to climate change or neglected tropical disease. In this critical phase, Germany assumes leadership and responsibility through EU Council presidency. Germany will be measured on the EU ability to manage and exit this crisis. Even though I'm an opposition politician of our government here, I support the German government in their role as an EU Council President. But it is important that Europe needs to be better prepared for the pandemic. We need to have unified prevention measurements and we should not close our borders because the viruses do not care about border lines or any kind of uh, passports that they do not have. The, SDGs is an important issue. I think it's now more and more important to realize that this is our roadmap for a safer and healthier, more resilient future for us all. We need to move on with uh, this, this program. We should never let this serious crisis go to waste as uh, once the chief of staff for President Obama, Ram Emanuel said in 2009, this is a warning and also a chance to enhance our systems and make us stronger and show resilience. Everybody, there, no, sorry, everything we do now and after the crisis must be with a strong focus on realizing that the SDGs are very important. They provide us with a ready-made universal framework to help and realize our collective ambitions to building a better world. We need to realize that health has to be in all policies and therefore I support the 2020 UNITE Summit Statement and now I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Mariam. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to join the first Global Summit and okay. to have the opportunity 
of sharing uh, experience from Georgia as well as uh, summarizing uh, some of the best practices and the lessons from uh, the global emergency response. I have the honor to speak not only as the regional chair for Eastern Europe and Central Asia for the Global Parliamentarians Network Unite, but as the former Deputy Minister of Health of Georgia and the former president of the Innovative Financing for Development based at the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs of France. Uh, let me structure my statement um, uh, around three major questions. The first is that the pandemic turned out to be the test of health systems and broader development across the world. Second, that the pandemic was also turned out as the test of democracy. And third, what can we as the policymakers, parliamentarians, decision makers can do for um, for the emergency response and for, for taking the, the actions. Uh, let me start with the review of the pandemic as the test to the health systems. Every nation, irrespective of their levels of health system investments and penetration of innovations and technologies in the local health settings, was affected by the COVID crisis. And the crisis has clearly demonstrated that the countries need more investments in the building blocks, the six classical building blocks of their health systems, starting from the lack of relevant and effective treatment or prevention, um, uh, pre prevention measures, the vaccines, diagnostics and uh, the medications uh, was the major challenge that all state leaders confronted. And it was promising to see the accelerated vaccine research initiatives credited by the United um, States, the United Kingdom, Israel and other nations. The crisis has demonstrated how vital it is to have relevant, sufficient and qualified workforce and how the workforce due to the limited access to the personal protective equipment and training were under the highest risk during the pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, um, we have to underline that women, um, women uh, uh, workers uh, within the healthcare settings were primarily affected as they were representing the vast majority of uh, the medical personnel. We have also seen how financing already extremely scarce for tackling other communicable diseases like HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, hepatitis C became even scarcer during the pandemic. Luckily, innovative financing mechanisms and international financing institutions stepped in to help countries to cope with the, the first, the initial wave of crisis but the uh, global response demonstrated how much, uh, how, how, how um, significant additional investments must be secured for uh, both building uh, and re, uh, rehabilitating the local health systems, as well as ensuring the long-term sustainability of funding for the global health response. The pandemic also um, was a clear demonstration how interlinked the different uh, sustainable development goals are. With the health crisis, we witnessed the collapse of the health systems, the education system, tourism and other sectors of economies. Poverty rates were uh, rising. Uh, and the second wave of pandemic uh, is not very promising in terms of the economic recovery across the, um, the regions. Um, finally, as the global um, policymakers and the, the national parliamentarians, we have to be aware that the pandemic uh, was a test to democracies in many of our nations. 
MDI and other international institutions increasingly document that democratically thinking leaders have used the pandemic for political consolidation and for multi-party response to the pandemic. While autocratic leaders have used the pandemic for uh, the control measures that were affecting, negatively affecting the democracy process at, uh, on the ground. So as the medical doctors and public health experts, definitely we have to first ensure that we do no harm to the patients. But as medical doctors and global health experts in the parliament, we should also ensure that we protect both the lives of our people and we protect freedom and democracy. Finally, as we all come together to endorse the statement of the first global summit, uh, the UNITE Summit, we as parliamentarians have a unique opportunity to influence and positively impact the decisions made around the health investments and investments in the broader SDG agenda. Georgia was one of the outstanding uh, countries in the global response. And even if today I'm uh, the leader of a new opposition party, I'm extremely proud how my, how my nation uh, responded to the global crisis. This was due to the strong national CDC capacity, the capacities that were built over decades, starting with the, the spectrum of communicable diseases, like immunization, HIV, TB, malaria, and hepatitis C. Um, we have also seen that even, we need, even if we need stronger evidence that countries with universal care coverage, universal health coverage, and strong uh, capacities for prevention and management of communicable diseases coped better during the, the COVID pandemic. Therefore, it's essential that we focus on strengthening universal health coverage agenda, as well as the broader sustainable development agenda amidst the COVID-19. This, I'm uh, proud to join the statement launched by the Global Parliamentarians Network Unite and to pass on uh, the floor to my colleague, the chapter chair uh, for Asia and Pacific, uh, Senator Pia Kaitana. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Hello and um, good day to everyone. My name is Pia Cayetano. I'm a senator from the Philippines, and I am the UNITE chapter chair for Asia Pacific. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about my work and uh, my perspective and what we're doing in UNITE. Um, my advocacy on infectious diseases is very personal to me. My father had hepatitis B, and he died in office as a senator of our country. And one of the first things I did, I ended up running for the Senate. I had no desire to be in politics, but that was what I ended up doing. And one of the things I wanted to do was um, find a solution for, for hepatitis B and, and uh, liver cancer. And in my ignorance, I thought the solution would be to build liver centers and to have uh, liver transplant um, doctors and all. But I quickly realized that the best solution was really raising awareness and um, prevention. And so my first bill in the Senate ended up being uh, the expansion of our immunization program to include funding and regular, regular uh, including um, hepatitis B in the immunization programs for infants. And I went on to chair the Senate Committee on Health for about, for about a decade, for almost a decade. So fast forward, um, I also was very active in uh, the Interparliamentary Union. And now let me just give you a quick perspective about um, Asia Pacific, because it is the, uh, the region that I chair. Um, it's a little bit difficult to give you one picture um, as an overview for roughly 58 countries. We're very different. So to, um, to illustrate um, Australia, they will be, they have achieved SDG3 on good health, but in comparison, the Philippines, my country, we are still very challenged to achieve uh, SDG3 on time. 
So everyone else is somewhere in between. And um, as it turns out, uh, it really will be a big challenge, even pre-COVID, for many of the countries to achieve all the SDGs. Um, but with effort, we will be able to achieve SDG 3 on good health, um, SDG 4 on education, SDG 6 on clean water, and so on and so forth. So it is possible. It is possible to achieve these goals. Um, I talk about SDGs because SDGs should really be our blueprint for COVID recovery efforts. Uh, I think there are more than enough experts who will tell you our personal experiences about how our own family members, people we know, have had difficulty accessing the most basic health services precisely because of COVID. Now, Asia was hard hit by COVID-19, but it will be noted, I believe it was in the news, that many of these countries were able to respond quickly, like Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Vietnam, and they were able to put in protective measures and rebound to a certain extent and reopen their economies. And this is because um, they learned from MERS, from SARS, and prepared for the future threat. And so if you think about it, our future really depends on what we do today. Now, um, as a background, the chairman, uh, the, the committee that I chair in the Senate now is the Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation, and Futures Thinking. And um, I've had the opportunity to invite a lot of experts. Um, our chair, Ricardo, um, owes, me a, uh, um, owes me a visit in our, in our health discussions one of these days. Um, but we've talked about the future of health. And to be able to understand this, you must understand what is the futures thinking mindset. According to Prosser and Basra, it is an avenue for different sectors to explore many possible futures. So you can't think of just one future. You have to be prepared. You have to envision different futures. Using strategic foresight to make informed decisions and to prepare for all kinds of possibilities and identify unforeseen opportunities. So in one of my hearings, I had a very interesting um, futurist. He was a foreigner. And he mentioned that the future of healthcare will be in the bathroom. And he said that a person would take a pill and a camera in the mirror would be able to send images of his body to a doctor, wherever that doctor is, for an immediate diagnosis. And in my mind, I was like, wait, wait, wait. Um, in my country, some people don't have a private bathroom. Um, some people um, don't even have running water. And much more for the connectivity that would allow you to take those kind of images. But then I realized that there are internet con uh, internet cafes all over the country. And we are also becoming known for our wellness destination. So if you think about it, uh, there is there are opportunities for this kind of development, for this kind of future in our country. It may not be exactly the same future of one country, but it would be an interesting future in development in the field of healthcare as well. So, um, but that's Philippines. And from a global perspective, what is the future of global health? Well, it's not very difficult for our health experts to foresee the threats and the possible innovations and solutions. I believe COVID has taught us that we can only come back from this stronger when we approach this from a global health point standard. What, pose, what poses more of a challenge for us is to ensure that political leaders listen, that we provide the proper funding for research, that leaders along with developmental partners work towards improving global health and access to all so that no country gets left behind. And I would like to end on this note. This is where UNITE comes in in promoting enhanced collaboration among regions and among countries. Thank you. Back to you, Ricardo. Thank you so much, Pia. And uh, thank you all uh, for your, your important and inspiring statements and your support uh, to the, our uh, uh, UNITE uh, Global Summit statement, hoping that uh, we will walk the, the talk and make sure that we imp we are capable of leading to the changes that we are aspiring to in these words uh, moving forward. And thank you all so for passing on effectively the, the floor for one to each other. It, we went around the world very quickly. And now 
it is my my great honor uh, to to introduce a, a dear friend and colleague, uh, Liam Byrne, uh, who I thank for joining to speak on the need of strong parliamentarism for global development. Honorable Byrne uh, holds many simultaneous uh, titles. He currently serves as shadow mayor for West Min the West Midlands. He's member of parliament for Birmingham Hodge Hill. Um, he, and he is also Wilm uh, Given Research Fellow at uh, Newfield College, Oxford. Liam also founded and chaired the all-party parliamentary group on inclusive growth and served on the Council of Europe. And um, I would say most importantly, at least to me, because I work for him in a way, he is chair of the Global Parliamentary Network of the IMF and the World Bank, where I am honored to be his uh, vice chair. Liam, thank you so much for finding the time, and we're very much lo looking forward to to your words on how uh, in the importance uh, on the importance of strong parliamentarism, and especially in the times where we are leading and the needs that we are facing in terms of international. Um, Ricardo, thank you Floresios. so much for that very kind introduction, and um, dear friends, it's a it's a real honor and a privilege for me to be able to join you uh, this afternoon, and I've just um, I've been listening. Um, uh, spellbound by just the most extraordinary set of presentations uh, from around the planet. Um, I'm the chair of the IMF World Bank uh, Parliamentary Network. Uh, that is a network of parliamentarians um, that does not advocate for the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, we help hold those multilateral institutions um, to account. Uh, and so as chair of that international network, uh, let me start by saying that I associate myself wholeheartedly with the statement that you have published this afternoon. Um, and I uh, confirm to you this afternoon that I will do whatever I can through the good offices of the network uh, to promote and to disseminate both the words of that statement uh, and the spirit which I know um, has gone into it. So, dear friends, I just wanted to say um, a few words this afternoon about our role. Uh, about our relationship uh, and about our roadmap um, for the future. Um, and I think you demonstrate all of those, uh, everything that I'm about to say with the extraordinary work that you have poured into um, this incredible creation of the Unite Network. It is precisely the kind of initiative which we need to multiply and extend um, over the years to come. Let me start with a word um, about uh, our role. Many of you uh, come from uh, a world of medical science um, and health services, but all of us are on the front line of love and loss during a crisis like this. Very often it is us as parliamentarians who are the compassion amidst the contagion. And that gives us a unique role, it gives us a unique place, and it gives us a unique responsibility to tell the stories behind the statistics. You look at the news about COVID from around the world today, you look at the kinds of numbers that we're talking about, enormous numbers, but we are the human face to those numbers. We're the people who tell the stories about the realities of what is going on. I've just finished an inquiry into why COVID fatalities are so much higher in our ethnic minority community. I have listened through hours of testimony to bring uh, those voices that often don't go heard to a wider public audience. I've heard the story about a mother who gave birth to her child and died of COVID before she was ever able to hold that child in her own arms. I've heard the stories of somebody who lost their childhood sweetheart, a pastor at their church, and then lost 15 members of her prayer group. She said that she was driven to the brink of suicide by the catastrophic loss that she suffered in the community around her. I've listened to children who have said goodbye to their parents as they went to work in the morning, never to see their parents again. And all of them faced that reality of not being able to be there with their loved ones when they left this world. They were not able to be there in the dying moments of, as they lost their loved ones. They were not able to grieve with the body. 
very often they were not able to be there when the funeral took place. They were not able to observe any of the rituals that all of us have had to create over thousands of years to deal with that agony of love and loss. And that will have huge consequences for mental health over the years to come, as a number of speakers very eloquently spoke about. We have a role and a responsibility to speak the reality about those stories behind the statistics. We have an incredibly important role as healers in our own community. We have a role as public leaders, as well as public servants, who are able to bring people together and from that agony of loss, argue for change. And that is what you have done so brilliantly uh, this afternoon. Now, one of the reasons that I love this initiative so much is because what you are helping pioneer here is what we need to do so much more of over the months and the years to come. And this brings me on to my second point, which is about the relationship between us. It's got to grow stronger. Pandemics do not stop at passport control. I think about the world of global shocks that I've lived through since I was elected to Parliament 16 years ago. I was elected during a time of war, and since then I've barely known a peace. I have lived through uh, global conflict, I have lived through a global financial crash, and now I'm living through a global contagion with difficult votes on Brexit thrown in in the middle. All of us have a role in our own countries at helping make sure that we hold executives to account for making good decisions and wise decisions on behalf of the people that we serve. But let's be honest, none of us have a monopoly on the truth. None of us have a monopoly on the right answers. All of us, therefore, have a responsibility to build stronger relationships around the world, both to learn from each other so that we can provide answers to the people that we serve based on the best information globally, but also so that we can act globally in a world that is more connected, ever closer connected together. We have got to be, I think, realistic about the truth that global shocks will continue. And therefore, that tighter and tighter relationship between us will only grow more important as we seek to make sure that multilateral institutions do what they were set up to do to bring that world of peace and security at the end of World War II. So I hope that you will be able to use the Global Parliamentary Network for the IMF and the World Bank as a stage for the arguments that you're making today and the ideas that you will have in the future. Some of you joined forces together with me and Gordon Brown and a number of other former prime ministers and presidents in an initiative that we took recently to write to the heads of the G20, the World Bank and the IMF, calling for much better, stronger, concerted action to make sure that children go back to school, especially girls. That is the kind of initiative that we need to do an awful lot more of um, over the years to come. And to help with that, during the annual meetings that begin on the 12th of October, we will be launching a new global digital platform, which I hope that you will use to make arguments about things that we can learn from each other, but the work that we have to do together uh, as well. The final point, Ricardo, that I wanted to make is about the roadmap um, for the years to come, because some of the speakers this afternoon very uh, helpfully reminded us of the framework of the SDGs that we have to hold on to. We all know that that agenda is going to get harder and harder. Uh, we may be looking at as many as 50% of jobs wiped out in Africa. We may be looking almost certainly now at the first rise in global poverty that we have seen uh, this century. That means that we have to step up the work that we do. That means we need to work much harder together to be clearer about the risks that lie ahead because the world has not simply got to recover from COVID. We have to navigate a world in which we now have what I call the three rises, the rise in temperature, the rise in new technology, and the rise in trade conflict. That is gonna create a much more complex environment in which we have to work together um, over the years to come, but it will present new opportunities for public policy to be used for the good. So, dear friends, I'm so grateful that you've invited me along here this afternoon to share a few thoughts with you and, crucially, to listen to your experience uh, from around the planet. Everything that I've heard today just underlines um, 
the opportunity that we have to build those tighter networks to advocate for change because we know that is the only way that we will best serve the people that we came into public life to help. Ricardo, let me stop there. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Liam. It was a fantastic speech and I think you wrapped it up very beautifully on bringing in an aspect that many times is overtaken, uh, which is the aspect of humanity and humanism in the act of political office uh, that we all share. Uh, but also speaking of the importance of multilateralism, the challenges of the roadmap ahead, but also uh, a message of hope that we can overcome this time of peril with hard work and collaboration. Thank you all, my dear friends, for joining from around the world. I'm tremendously honored to be by your side as we move forward. And we're now going to do a very quick break before the closing session with the WHO uh, Director General, Dr. Tedros Ebreezus, and with uh, the Honorable uh, US Representative in Congress, uh, Donna Shalala, for our closing session. Thank you once again, and I'll see you in a few minutes.